from power on to a usable state. In this case, I've designed user space from the point that the kernel hands itself over to init till the point that the login manager starts up. Uh, in the next few slides, you will see why I chose that metric. From when it starts. So basically, from the point that you see the little X or uh, stopwatch cursor. Yeah. So I'm going to be doing this on Angstrom distribution running on a Beagle board. <laughs> it's a reasonably fast platform. Um, um, the Angstrom distribution has been optimized for the platform. I chose the Beagle board because I work at TI and Angstrom because I'm the maintainer of it. So this was a nice platform to test system beyond. It has enough RAM, it has a fast CPU. So that's why we started at system D scales down to much smaller platforms, but I want to have a really fast boot time, so I chose this platform. But in the end of the presentation, I have to cheat a bit because my boot up turned out to be CPU limited, so I switched to a fast CPU. On a bigger board, I got down to approximately two seconds, and I thought, well, I need to get it below the mythical one second. I couldn't really make that work, and switched to the panel board, and with the second core, Active and system D parallelism will get less than one second. So it's cheating a bit, but nevertheless, less than one second. So uh, the panel board and the Beagle board are very similar in their boot up sequence. One is using an OMAP 3, one is using an OMAP 4. Both will be booting from an SD card. So we have different stages in the boot up. The ROM code will load the first stage bootloader from SD card, set up. Uh, into SRAM, that will set up the DDR, can load the second stage bootloader, which will load the kernel, the kernel is in it, and it runs, user space, and then at the end you have your user session, for example, you don't test. So when I started, these were the approximate timings. The ROM based bootloader, I have no way to time it, it's practically instantaneous. It's not loading 20 kilobytes out of SD into SRAM, that's, that's fast enough for the stage bootloader. <laughs> is a bit slower, you boot 12 seconds, that includes a 3 second boot delay which says press any key 3, 2, 1. Kernel, 7 seconds, but then the user space session, it took about 2 minutes for GDM to start up, and then about 20 seconds for GDM to get ready. And after logging in you spend even more time waiting for the GNOME desk to come up, but that's a different problem. So, how do you make this faster? Well, you can do the kernel bootloader startup optimization, but I really wanted the more generic solution. And, well, every ULC has a presentation about how to hack the bootloader to do execute in place, optimize it, so I'm not going there. User sessions, the GNOME people have been optimizing it as well, so I'm not going there as well. And these are prior code changes, so that brings me to the problem. I'm not a programmer. So what did I do? I decided to focus on the part that was the slowest in my case, and it is shellcode. I can do shellcode, and but then I found a solution which was written by the Rockstar team. System D. So it's not System D with a capital D. It doesn't have space and it has to, doesn't have any French accents. So it's just System D, no capitalization. That's it. So what is system D? Uh, you might have seen Leonard's talk where he explained what it is and what it can do. But basically, it's a replacement for sys in it. Uh, it's from the ground up, it's a new design. It's not something like Upstart, which is kind of new, but uses sys feed in it. It's completely different. So that's a good thing. I get sys feed in it. And it has a heavy emphasis on parallelism. So I never really bought into that because when I started in Bennett Linux about eight years ago, we tried parallelism and it turned out to be slower than just a linear startup, but then we're still using uh, SysD in it with basic box of shell. So I wasn't really convinced <coughs> that SysD would work, but I had to try it. So open up a website. Hey, I actually have met these people in person, so that's a good sign. Gustavo was there, he knows about Embedded, so yeah, 
But then there's a big safety on embedded. He says things like, yeah, we can do all the audio mixing with software because we have fast floating point. I'm like, no, we don't have fast floating point. But Gustavo being there, that's a good sign for embedded. Well, the website is this is an embedded consulting firm available for support. So that's a good thing. So textual instrument, we could say, <coughs> if something goes wrong, we could just pay people to fix it. And more importantly, it was scheduled to get included into Fedora. And I think Susie is now planning to use it. No idea on Ubuntu. There's uh, a package for Arch Linux. You can install it in Debian. Basically, any grown up distribution has a system B package. This is another good thing. So it's not like Upstart or OpenRC, which is used by a single distribution. But it didn't have any shell scripts. So shell script was something I could do. But then I discovered that what replaces it, system D units, are actually really like open embedded recipes to build system I work on. You can express dependencies, it has a readable format, and it gets rid of all the boilerplate you need. So, good, try to build it, cross compile cleanly without any errors. Also a good sign, uses an auto tools build system, so if something goes wrong, I can fix it. Um, Everything is managed in Git at freedesktop.org, so I don't have to go to a bunch of bizarre, really strange stuff. So, for me, this was basically the perfect program, managed in the perfect way. So, what I did when I got started, I watched all the videos of the system presentation. Then I tried to read all the blog posts about system D, which were too many to read. Learned this. I think one every week. And he has been doing that for a long time now. And I joined the System D RFC channel. And the last one was the biggest save because you had direct access to the developers. And thankfully, I'm on a similar time zone as them. So, someone had already integrated it into Open Embedded as a recipe. So, I tried that. Uh, I had some problems with the serial console because we changed things around. Fixed that, got serial console working, so I was really, really, feeling really happy. I have an inner system and I can get a serial console. So, welcome back to the 60s. And I booted a small rooter vest and I was wondering how to get timing info. It turned out that System D has a built in timing system, which is really good. Since in my experience with running Bootshark or Bootshark Lite, it has a significant overhead. And if you want to get down in the second range, any overhead is a big no-no. So built-in timing info, also a big plus. So what's really really happy? So I typed in system D and last time. Oh, it needs a Python interpreter. Install Python, Python Dbus, Python Cairo, timing info, as well as this view. So digging deep. It turns out that I was using it in SysV in a compatibility mode, and because my init scripts were named slightly different, they were using SysV in the scripts. Not a good thing. So, what I did, I masked them. For example, UDEV, uh, we had a cache to make UDEV faster. Uh, I disabled that so we could just run only UDEV, mask the other people's init script, things like that. That got better than I went to the GitHub for Arch Linux. They have a lot of sample units for all the programs they use. So I adapted the OpenSSH one for the Dropbear SSH <coughs> server. So that got started on demand with socket activation. So yeah, that made it better. And then I complained a lot in the system channel. And uh, frankly, Gustavo took pity on me. So we're now down from 60 seconds to 80, 18 seconds. And this is no graphical interface. I mentioned login manager uh, at the start. This is just zero console. So it's still really, really bad that we needed 60 seconds to get to the serial login and CSV in it. But we could do it in 18 seconds in uh, system. So that's the most improvement.
previous laptop blew up, and this is an eight-year-old laptop with a keynote version that does not allow you to embed any SVGs in your presentation. So. system degenerates, so it has a timeline, you can scroll, 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 scroll to the right, so 18 seconds, and then it can show you what happens. Red is that it, the server is activated and busy, and you can see that there are large gaps in it, so here there's the start of the second gap, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah, that sadly doesn't work. You can make it Next bigger. conference I'll be using on the next laptop. That full screen will actually work. So you, you get the idea that it's not really uh, optimized and parallel and fast. So I started to look at what happened and one of the things I mentioned about UDEV cache, we had lots of problems with UDEV, that UDEV took a lot of time to just do its work. So Kai said, well, type this command, time the trigger, uh, the trigger exits immediately, so you can settle, and that was always 180 seconds. And that was funny, because Kai did a commit a week before, which set a timeout of 180 seconds. So we were hitting the timeout. What was the case? They took several. We were using old kernel headers, I think 2632, and UDEV was using the SysX4 system call, which was present in the kernel, but not enabled for ARM. That was somewhere in 36 or 37. So we had to rebuild eGLC and patch the kernels because on bigger board we had an old 2632 kernel, panel board a slightly newer 2635 kernel. So, backport serves big update rebuild. <coughs> Just to use the 2637 headers because this was a few months ago when 2637 was still new. Uh, we patched the Beagle kernel and we patched the Pine kernel. We, I actually added two more patches. Uh, the location for the SysFS or CPU, something changed that is basically one line of kernel patching unit. So we had the most recent UDEF and system D running on 2.6.32 with a handful of patches. So that's not too bad. Now we have three seconds. So we saved approximately 15 seconds by just fixing, no, well, not fixing UDEF, but fixing the tool chain to have UDEF work. seconds and you see pretty much everything is starting in order. So I was down to two seconds. How can I make it even faster? So I removed some unused UDEF rules. Uh, I don't need BG photo UDEF rules. I don't need a lot of UDEF rules. I just want to do it as fast as possible and still be able to launch GDM. Uh, I disabled a few systemd features like the feed console setup. I like the built-in kernel form, I don't need the other forms. It had a few mount points like debugger pass, which added a slight overhead, so I removed that. And I switched to the backup board. So, down to 1.1 seconds. Good, but not good enough. I was really close. <laughs> Changed a bit. I had a few patches and Kate cleaned them up, and we can now measure uh, the kernel time is put in here as well, and then the user space time. It also now reports 
the, your host name and the kernel that you're running on. So that makes it a bit easier if you have a lot of machines to keep the plots straight. And at the bottom, it has a summary saying maybe 57 milliseconds per month. Oh wait, this is normal. Sorry. That one. So at the bottom, you get the idea. Now, trying to make it less than one second. It is kind of a magical number. Most of the computations are including in less than one second. So, what did I try? I set the CPU governor to performance, so it always runs at full tilt. It was either used as basic or on demand. Let's burn everything and just make it fast. Switch to a faster D card, and I complained a lot more in the system each channel. So, then at that point, I was down to almost one second. But I had succeeded in doing it under a second before. So I was thinking, what did I change? Oh, I guess you would. So what happens if I don't output the serial? Well, there we have it. And if we scroll back, kernel 3.7 seconds, and you disable doing the serial, 1.6 seconds. So you say you've made a humongous amount of time just not outputting to serial. Yeah, but even if you move it to one mega, uh, megabit, the overhead of the print cake to serial in the kernel is also in there, so you just don't output to serial. <coughs> and the problem with serial at one megabit is you have to patch the kernel and your host to actually support <coughs> one megabit. So I shaved off three more seconds. I was able to do the lane you would, that was an easy one. So now, <coughs> this picture here. And that shows how much the rest of the system sucks. <laughs> Again, in the, at the start, the user space was two minutes, so you were saying, yeah, that's an abomination. Get that down to a more manageable level, like 10 seconds. So we got down to 0 0.8, so that was a really good job. But you boot nine seconds, what's it doing? It turns out it's loading from a SD card, copying the kernel into RAM, moving it and doing all kinds of silly things, so we need to optimize that. No. No. The previous slide was 12 seconds, now it's nine seconds, that is the three second countdown eliminated. So one of the options uh, is to enable caching in U-Boot, but it turns out that U-Boot is completely broken if you turn on data cache. So as an intermediate fix, what we're going to do for a new board is to make a data cache command. So you say data cache on, load the kernel from SD into RAM, and turn the data cache off, otherwise you break USB in the network. We could also try to eliminate the bootloader and just use static configuration headers, but then everything would be <coughs> extremely board specific and we want to avoid that. So I'd like to get the U-Boot down to like one or two seconds, instead of nine seconds. Kernel, 1.5 seconds, that's not too bad. And um, GDM is just, yeah, we could probably need to switch to IDM. Yes? No, this is not the OMAP that boots from BSP, that is the OMAP L, this is the boots from one code on, on the CPU. Yeah, that's what it's with the configuration header, you can just tack a header onto the kernel and then the ROM code is, is smart enough to load it, but that has some problems and depend on, on the vintage of the CPU. <coughs> I have a number of old Beagle boards where the configuration header does not really work. So, yeah. <coughs> so a few weeks ago we got U-Boot SPL working. A uh, little bit of background. MLO is a fork of U-Boot which is approximately five years old. And the U-Boot hackers have now something called SPL which is a second program loader which is basically a way to compile down U-Boot to something that fits into SRAM. We're currently down to uh, 24 kilobytes for U-Boot SPL, <coughs> while the U-Boot, the big U-Boot is almost 300 kilobytes. 
it's almost as big as the Linux kernel nowadays. So if we use U SPL, we can just skip U boot, but then we would uh, U boot SPL is slightly slower than that because it also looks uh, lacks the data cache things because in MLO we turn the data cache on because we don't have any that we don't have to worry about. But that would be eliminated. And for the user session switch to light VM or slim or just no VM would obviously make that faster as well. And I've already shown that one. So further steps to do is um, investigate LSO, LSO as a kernel compression or even uncompressed kernels. Uh, after I've written the slides, I did some experimentation on a slower arm. With LZO compression, the kernel was approximately 3.5 megabytes, uncompressed 7. And due to you would being slow, we, it was actually slower by using an uncompressed kernel. If we can speed up U boot and use an uncompressed kernel, we can skip, skip the deep compressing step because that also takes about a second and we can shave up a second more. Uh, I've talked about the dcache command for U boot and this GDM. And well, GNOME 2.x is a dead end, so maybe you should switch to Enlightenment to do that with the QEs. Uh, why don't you don't switch to Bearbox? Basically, on Bearbox, we are much faster than we can use again. Uh, why you don't switch to Bearbox instead of UBoot? Basically, we can be much faster and we have the cache USB in it already. Um, we don't really have any Bearbox experience in, in TI. We have a few people who work on Bearbox, but most of our software teams are working with you. And as much as I hate to admit it, it is a universal bootloader, so Bearbox might be better. Um, then we have to explain to management why, if you Google it, you only hit set this porn. So, <laughs> Bearbox is a bit of a touchy subject, but that will make it better. And you could SPL is actually looking really good now. So, if Bearbox uh, does the job, we can switch to it, but right now we're working on you and you would SPL. We're at TR, we're already really, really happy to get rid of and basically, basically, Bearbox is itself as an SPL, so you yeah. we already get rid of uh, the slower. We don't use it anymore. Yeah. We, we, someone had it already running on BeagleWord and it was working. Panai is done. 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 On Panda, we did the STM uh, months before we used it. So we basically used Bearbox, a small version of Bearbox itself, mm -hmm. and the STM. And you can jump into kernel, use the LZO kernel compression, yeah. and it started working. Yeah. So the, if it, you can use Bearbox as well and eliminate the 9 seconds you would. It's basically the, the variation of the team can be <coughs> And uh, for the QE, switch to software. So we're going to use the demo mode. So the resources, ancient distribution, the system D wiki. That also links to Leonard's website where he has his blog and all the map pages. <coughs> Google, Google is really good at answering questions. And all the SVG files I showed, and some some more timing information you can find at the bottom right. <coughs> so, now let's switch to the terminal. <coughs> so this is the panel board and system the analyzes reports the boot time. So I reflexed when you review. Oh, sorry. So that was reasonably fast. So we're below one second. But it also has the blame tool, which takes a while to run. And it shows you all the different services and how much time they took. And you might wonder if you added up that adds up to more than a second, but basically everything is running parallel. Uh, one of the noteworthy ones is the command. You can see it's about approximately 364 milliseconds, and it didn't get an IP address. <laughs> so on this network, so it can work in that day. Uh, I tried Network Manager, and Network Manager waits till everything is finished, which takes two and a half seconds. So 
uh, with the default network manager units they deliver, your boot will always be longer than two and a half seconds. Con man uh, just starts up and goes <coughs> into the background and does all the DHCP in the background. And it's really fast. And it gets actually an IP faster than the two and a half seconds of network manager, but that's because they have a built-in DHCP library, so they avoid a uh, few deeper calls and call them some client. It's all in milliseconds, but it's, it works really well. So if you want to have a fast boot time and fast reconnect, Conman is actually the answer. So, and yeah. um, so I just wanted to say that um, the items for consulkit demo and consulkit lock system start service we um, kind of forward into system D anyway. So you can just remove that. Um, you're basically uh, you're doing the same stuff twice in that area, and the other thing is you can probably remove arches work as well, unless you need persistent logging, because by default in system D all the logging goes to a K message. Um, yeah, I, I, I turned arches log on because when I was still had the serial console enabled, you would get lots of spew, and I wanted to clean it up for this, this presentation, so I disabled the serial console, so wait, you, you don't see the kernel in that. Um, our syslog really has a small overage, you can see 73 milliseconds and enabling it and this enabling didn't impact the boot time, so I just leave it enabled so I have the system logging. I heard some rumors about a system D project to replace it, so I'm waiting that. <laughs> still has system feed legacy enabled and lots of other things. Yeah. So that can, that can be uh, removed. You can. I tried it and it didn't really impact it that much when it was trying to get down from a second. So you can make it even faster if you wanted to by doing that. Uh, there are a lot of other things to turn off, but for me, it's low one second, I'm happy already. So I can show you what happens if you still have legacy involved and have uh, system D. So. This is still the bootloader. Can anyone, everyone see? It's a bit tiny, but it's tough to illustrate the point that uh, see, now the kernel starts up, so it took a really long time to get through the bootloader. And Output into the screen is, isn't the fastest art, <coughs> but we have a ton of legacy in there, all system and scripts, etc. etc. You can see a long time, <coughs> still less than two minutes, far less than two minutes. Now we have the exposure, and now we're waiting for GDM to come up. Still waiting for GDM to come up, and GDM. So, this illustrates that. The panel board that was an optimized system, um, basically if you have a base entry install and you spend half an hour just deleting some system D units and the console in half an hour, you can get, can get it moving really fast. On the Vigo board, it takes a while because the CPU is slower and everything that's after the C, XFC is starting up, taking a really long time. And now we have that system, but it's approximately a minute and a half, which is still not really acceptable, but this is the uh, running a desktop on an embedded CPU at the demo, so it's not really indicative of any real life. <coughs> so even if you have system D and you follow all of this and then you add content crap in there, it has its feeling in the script, it will slow down a lot. So there is a lot of room for improvement and in next one we're trying to prefer things as much as possible. But we encountered our uh, inner scripts that basically do a mod row, a sleep, in an up, a sleep, and then uh, start the application using the flex mode. And Kai was saying, well, why do you sleep? A recent mod row will only return after it already has created the device in the kernel. And if you do that, you don't even need the app come up. So what I did, I split that into two units, one for the mod row and the other uh, waiting for the device to appear. In system D, you can tag devices with new dev rules, so you can just say start the script as soon as this uh, device node appears, and we say approximately 30 seconds with initializing the framework. So even if 
system D itself is not helping with making it faster, it just helps you to remove a lot of brain dead <coughs> historical baggage in a lot of industries. So I work for a silicon vendor, and we still have remnants of our old 2610 Monte Vista based systems there, which we just copied them on because they worked. And when we are evaluating it, a lot of historical baggage, we are removing it as much as possible. So for the next thing, the next, do you have it? The next big award, which we're going to announce on Monday, the goal for this one is to have a 10 second boot time. It doesn't have a display, so we don't have to wait for GDM, but you plug it on and after 10 seconds, all the web servers and things have been initialized and are accessible. And the kernel boots in 0 0.8 seconds, user space boots in three and a half seconds, so we're like, ah, we're there already, but we still have you. We're now working on fixing that. So uh, when you order this at the end of the month, you get it with an SD card, running system D and all things, and it will be booting in less than 10 seconds. And if we can fix the boot load properly, it will be in less than five seconds, and if you try to get it done more and more. One of the things we're waiting on the web service we're using, it's the fancy Node.js server, and it does not support web activation yet. If we do that, we can eliminate a chunk of I.O. and it would make things a lot better. It would make the first run a bit suck more for people to have to wait uh, for it to appear in the browser, but we can live with that. So that is the real life implementation that I was working on for a new product, so I could spend a lot of time on it. It's for more public projects. So now we can go to the question section. Hi, are you going to uh, um, modify Anstrom to use System D? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, we already have done so, but since in action we're on the switch from open embedded classic to open embedded core. The classic one is not maintained anymore and in open embedded core the file system we recommend to build have system be integrated and have a few tweaks to make it faster. And at some point we're just going to blacklist this fee in it so you cannot absolutely build it for action even if you wanted to. Uh, you know, just a comment. I, I noticed that you boot will come up faster when you relocate the kernel without the watchdog. You know, because when you got the watchdog, you basically move it back. You have to do something with the watchdog, and then you move it, move it back again, and so forth. So, I'm not sure how much that saves, but maybe half a second or so. That's a good suggestion. All the things that because every millisecond save in the bootloader is one you can move to use space to start more stuff. Any more uh, so you basically didn't change much of the startup scripts. They still, but they started with SysV uh, with the system D. Yeah, well, the most of the basic things that we start uh, that you need for X, Dbuzz, uh, console kit, UDAV, have their have SysV. Uh, sorry, system D units upstream, and if you install them and install the init script, it will mask the init script and use the built-in units. So um, I didn't need to change anything upstream already changed it, and that is one of the duties. If you just name your unit like the init script, you don't need to remove the init script, it will use the native unit. So that's a big boom. And for things like Dropware, I just changed the uh, OpenSSH one and send the Dropware people the best to do that. We have the code available, the yeah. source code, or the new yeah. script. In this case. <laughs> yeah, uh, they are really, really short. Uh, for Dropware, we register the socket, which is basically <coughs> this. You, you say it conflicts with the server, so we want to have it on demand instead of started always. Uh, we want to listen to port 22. And we have a proper keyload service. And they're also available in open embedded, but it just can to show them here. And that just says if I don't have a key, I'm going to generate one. And uh, that's it. They are really tiny. You don't need 
in the boil plate, and what I basically did is download the SSH one and just run set to change SSH key to block there. So this is it is this easy to uh, write simple units. The more advanced units you need to read it a bit. Uh, I always get confused with the after and before. I re mentally refer to it, but we discovered that's not all fast enough. Uh, there are tons of examples out there on GitHub. If you go to the Arch Living one, maintained by Falcon Indy, it has tons and tons of units. If you know where Fedora keeps it, Git and CPS, which I keep forgetting, they have tons and tons of uh, units as well. So if you can think of to start something, there's a unit for it. There are a few uh, examples, I think. LVM and some databases making <coughs> up a fuss about not being able to write units. Has that been resolved yet? Similarly to def zero, because we have a UDEF cache in its script and no native unit because we don't need to cache. Uh, UDEF got fixed. We deleted all the stupid rules we had that were super foolish. So we don't need to cache service anymore. So we don't want systemd to start that in, uh, in its compatibility mode. So we just created a file with UDEF cache name, dot service, and similarly to def null. And it is not started anymore. That's what they call mask. So if you temporarily want to disable a service, that's an easy way I think the system control also has uh, a way to automatically do that mask. Yeah. And the best thing is you can do systemd analyze. Plot, and it will output an SVG to standard output. <laughs> <laughs> Which gives you the plots I showed you. And I saved that to a file consisting of the host name and the time. So if you go to the, the last link to dominion slash systemd, you will see things like BeagleBoard 2011 dot something something of SVG, and those are the plot files uh, with time and host name. And thanks to the improvements, the plots include uh, host name, kernel, and timing information. I don't think they include the date yet, I think it's an patch for that. <coughs> so you can track it. And this is a really useful tool, it's uh, 
not as verbose as Bootshark. Bootshark does a lot more. And I think Bootshark now also has a good unit. Uh, uh, Um, and that sounded actually really, really interesting and way more advanced even than Bootshark because, well, in, in, in some ways more advanced than Bootshark because it could actually um, track dependencies between uh, processes, what way you woke up what and stuff like that. And with, yeah, but it doesn't track I.O. the way Bootshark does. And yeah, this tool doesn't uh, track I.O. either. So you probably uh, want to have all, this, all, all three of them. I need to track I.O. because up to this point, it is still uh, CPU limited. I don't even know why. Intuition would say it is. There's uh, stuff we can do about that. Uh, I don't need it. And I think when we move up to the faster ARM chips, it will start to become IO limited. So I would like to see what's happening, what it's using IO. If system D can do it natively, that's good. If we need bootshark, we can do it as well. But uh, already having the blame time and plot tools available natively without any overhead, that is really cool. That has helped me a lot. And I hope it continues to help people as well. Yeah, I mean, um, we optimize our stuff obviously for the desktop because that's what we have, but I heard we'll soon have the, the, the new pen board as well. Um, so we might actually look into that and do our streams working that and optimizing that. Way. Because there's a lot of room still. I mean, if I, if I look at this through all this, um, I like the optimizations you did are awesome. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff still to do. Okay. Um, I just got the stop sign, so I'll just make one last remark. Uh, I wanted to test the uh, newer panda board, but it couldn't get to me in time. And I hope it would struggle faster and get it even putting in less time, and maybe having even more CPU power helps with <coughs> stuff like that.